Today we're talking about ideas from education and how they could be applied to machine learning and artificial intelligence, particularly to leaderboards. Leaderboards are everywhere these days. These are the magical pieces of code that take a Docker container as input and then determine whether or not you have achieved state-of-the-art results, so did, or not. There are lots of perspectives about whether leaderboards are a good thing. I think it's a mixed bag. Having a common basis for comparison is good, but sometimes it puts engineering ahead of understanding. All that being said, I'm not an extremist. I don't think leaderboards should be abolished, but they could be better. So today, let's talk about some of the ways that we could make it better and how some of the deficiencies of Today's leaderboards could be addressed and improved by the techniques that we talked about in our last video, item response theory. I'm going to lay out five ways that we can do better evaluation with the insights of item response theory. One, have the right difficulty questions. Two, have the questions be as discriminative as possible. Three, minimize ambiguity and emphasize fairness. Four, don't be overly confident about making decisions about who the winner is. And five, be flexible. Okay, we'll go through all of these, but first we need to review in a little bit more detail about what a leaderboard is. System comes in, usually as a Docker container, you run it on some questions, it gives you answers to those questions, and you automatically evaluate whether the answers it produced are correct or not, and out comes a score. And if you get the high score, you win. I'm going to focus on question answering today because I have examples ready, but I'm sure that you can see how this would apply to any natural language processing task where you're producing answers that might be difficult to judge correctness for. But for the sake of concreteness, we'll stick to question answering. Let's say again that we have two question answerers that you want to distinguish, Ken, who's smart, and Bert, who's, uh, well, not. Let's say that you have a set of questions and you see how Ken and Bert answer all those questions. Maybe there isn't a good distribution over the difficulty of the questions. If there are a bunch of easy questions and a bunch of impossible questions, if you just look at the accuracy, you can't tell whether Ken or Bert is smarter, even though we as omniscient observers in this thought experiment know that Ken's skill is actually much higher. They get all the easy questions right, and they get all the impossible questions wrong. It's actually the diagonal here that we care about, where one subject gets questions right, and the other subject gets questions wrong. This is where we learn stuff. To see how we can make that happen in the framework of item response theory, let's go back to the equation. How do you get probabilities to be close to 0.5? Let's assume the feasibility is 1. If you want the probability of the response to be 0.5, then the exponential needs to be 1, which happens when the input to the sigmoid function is 0, which means that theta minus beta is near 0. In other words, you want the skill to be about equal to the difficulty. And this matches both educational theory from Vygotsky and what happens if you want to take an adaptive computerized test like, say, the GRE. Vygotsky's zone of proximal development says that students are most productively challenged when questions are neither trivial nor impossible. It helps them push forward what they know and extend their capabilities. And this is what we want to happen for AI as well. We want to push the intelligence of these machines forward. And this also is what happens if you go in and sit in front of a computerized test taking the GRE. Keep getting questions right, you'll get harder questions. If you keep getting questions wrong, you'll get easier ones. And eventually, you'll get into a range where you're getting around half of the questions right, and these are the questions that most accurately measures your skill, your data. If you've watched my rant about Watson's Tour de Force performance on Jeopardy, we can make that rant a little more mathematical using item response theory. I said that the questions on that competition were too easy for Ken and Brad. Indeed, 
Now we can say that the questions were not appropriately calibrated to measure their skill. Which, after all, was the whole point of the exercise. We wanted to know if the skill of Watson was higher than the skill of Kin and Brad. In other words, we wanted to know if Theta Watson was greater than Theta Kin. And I don't think it is. I think it is actually probably something more like this. But if the average difficulty of the questions were well below the participant's skill, then who gets which questions right just comes down to randomness. And in Jeopardy, that is decided by the buzzer, as I talked about in the previous video. Link in the description if you want to see that rant. So if I were to redo the human-computer matchup, I would push the curve a little bit to the right to make sure that the questions were of sufficient difficulty to challenge both sides but not impossible for either. This is how you make sure that you have a fair determination. So if you're assembling a data set from found questions, check that you have a good distribution of difficulty. And if you're generating questions, make sure that they have a good mix of difficulty. Instruct your authors to write a good range of questions based on who you think will take your test. On to point two, make sure your questions are discriminative. Remember that the IRT defines the parameter gamma as a coefficient that measures how clear the signal is from each question. In our previous video, we talked about how infinitely discriminative questions are essentially step functions that let you pinpoint a user's skill. Again, this is impossible, but the more discriminative the question is, the better the question. And y'all know what's coming now. If I were a dictator of question answering, I'd make every question discriminative by using pyramidal questions that are structured to reward knowledge, and you interrupt the question to show when you know the answer. Like to answer this question, you need to know that Emmanuel Chicaneda was the librettist who appeared as Papa Geno, and what Papa Geno does in this opera. And you have to solve this multi-hop question without knowing either of their names. And if you know a bit more, you might be able to recognize Tamino by name. And then finally, at the end of the question, you get Enchanted Woodwind Instrument if you really need the help. This pyramidal way of answering questions, where only a few people can answer early and everybody can answer at the end, makes sure that every question is discriminative. So, if you're creating or curating a question collection, you want the discrimination to be high. But discrimination can also reveal problems in your data set. Here's an example from Squad that we looked at in uh, this paper. Pedro Rodriguez is the first author. As systems get smarter, they're more likely to get this question wrong. Gamma, the discriminability, is negative. And you can see why. This is a complicated question that's hard to answer with span selection. The question is asking why the demand for rentals decreased. But the thing is, this is a false presupposition. The demand didn't decrease, the supply decreased. And for complicated reasons. The lack of a land value tax, restrictive zoning, NIMBY politics, and lots of other factors are why the supply of rental housing decreased. But even if you have a smart system, if you're limited to the input-output paradigm of squad, you can't say that sort of stuff. And I shouldn't be saying that either, since this is not a urbanism video. Okay, so on to the next suggestion. Maximize fairness, minimize errors and ambiguity. We gave an example of how the gamma term can detect bad questions, but so can the lambda term. The smaller the feasibility is, the minimum probability of a system getting it right. So even if you're very smart, there's something wrong about the question that basically turns anyone trying to answer it into a coin flip. One source of randomness could be ambiguous questions, covered in more detail in AmbigQA from C1 Min. Here are three examples from natural questions with their official answers. Take a look at them, pause the video if you need to. Do you see any problems with these questions? They're making some assumptions here. Who's Michigan? The question assumes that it's the University of Michigan's men's football team. What if you answered with Michigan State's women's cross-country team? 
You'd get this question as wrong as if you had answered 1492 before Michigan was a state and before Michigan State had a cross-country team. This next question again assumes a men's sports team, even though the women's team has won more recently. Here are the champs in 2018. But that's not the only assumption happening here. There's also field hockey. But then again, the best either the men's or women's team for the US has ever done is third place. So maybe that's a reasonable way to resolve this ambiguity. In addition to the bias against women, or at least their sports teams, there's also a bias towards English-speaking countries. No slight to Dalver Bandari, but Kotaro Tanaka was arguably more important historically. He was Chief Justice of the Japanese Supreme Court in the post-war period and helped build up the independent judiciary under its new constitution. So let's see how this could screw up a leaderboard. We already talked about how if questions are too hard or too easy, they don't really count. So let's say that if we have some discriminative questions. But there are going to be some mistakes in here as well. If the proportion of mistakes is uniformly distributed, that's not a huge problem. But both wrong difficulty and infeasible questions diminishes the useful set of questions. But what I think is going on for a lot of current data sets is that we have the following problems. There are too many hard and easy questions, and the annotation error that diminishes feasibility is correlated with the questions that should be discriminative. So let's parameterize this by yet another Greek letter, rho. How many questions are actually discriminative and not the victim of annotation error? In a collaboration with Ben Bershinger at Google, we did some simple experiments to see how many examples in your test set you'd need to separate systems with 95% confidence. If two systems are separated by a point of accuracy, you need a couple thousand questions to tell systems apart, more if the accuracy of the systems is closer to 0.5. But if only 10% of your questions are discriminative, you need 10 times as many questions. And this is why I argue for the Manchester paradigm. Its norms mean that there will be less ambiguity and more discrimination. But even for the Cranfield paradigm, you can use IRT to select which questions are going to be the most effective. Going back to the previous paper by Pedro, we showed this in an experiment recreating squad. You get better discrimination among who is the top of the leaderboard using IRT to select which questions to find answers for. Okay, so now on to the next way we can do evaluation better with IRT. Don't be overly definitive. Let's say that you go to a leaderboard and the current top score is 24601. You run your system and you get 24602. Do you pop the champagne? Hopefully you can see why you should be skeptical that you are actually the winner of the leaderboard. This is part of the reproducibility crisis in natural language processing. Jesse Dodge talks about this in his recent thesis. And while we could do hypothesis testing, IRT provides an alternative. You have a big Bayesian model of random variables that encodes how smart each of the subjects the system submitted to the leaderboard are. So you could just ask the question, what's the probability that the skill of answerer I is greater than the skill of answerer J? For the system result that we just talked about, the answer is probably going to be zero. Okay, last way we can do evaluation better, be flexible. And this isn't specifically about IRT, but I wanted to squeeze it in here because IRT is associated with high stakes exams. The outcome is super important and Whenever you have money on the line or an education on the line, there are grievance processes so that if something goes wrong in the test, you can correct the problem. And this reflects a truth of evaluation, especially in natural language processing. Anytime you're generating text, evaluation is hard. Think about machine translation. There are many correct ways to translate a long sentence. You can't have an answer set that includes all of the possible good translations. Question answering, especially long form question answering, is also a generative task. In the Manchester paradigm for high stakes adjudication, sometimes you get answers from subjects that you don't expect. And if you just slavishly followed the rules, you'd mark them as wrong. So let's see how they handle this on Jeopardy when 
a screwball contestant gives a crazy answer that the judges weren't expecting. Operation 2000. Your surgeon could choose to take a look inside you with this type of fiber optic instrument. Jordan. What is an endoscope? Nope. Evelyn. What is a laparoscope? That's it. Before we get into the final, a brief explanation for the reason that the scores are different now than they were a few seconds ago when we went into the commercial break. We should have been a little bit more specific on our clue about the laparoscope. Turns out the laparoscope is a kind of endoscope. So we are crediting Jordan with an extra 4,000. And through the magic of editing, the whole process of calling up judges sequestered in a secret room it gets hidden from the audience, but it's an important part of the process. And it's an important part of the process because it's impossible to think of all the ways that a question could be answered correctly. So you should almost always double check your automatic metrics with a human. Even if you don't change the result, you'll learn something useful. And some people might say that standardized tests and Jeopardy aren't as high stakes as leaderboards, but I think that's a subject that is open to debate. And remember, the real goal here is not sodaing, getting a state-of-the-art result. If we want machines that can understand text and answer questions, then that's only going to happen if we, the developers of those systems, understand what the machines are doing. And mindlessly chasing a number is not going to make that understanding happen, no matter what dopamine you rush you get from seeing the number up here as a new row in the leaderboard. There's no substitute for looking at your data, but item response theory can help point you in the right direction to see what is important. This is just a single lecture from a course. YouTube likes to show you these videos out of order, but if you go to the course webpage linked below, you can see the lectures in the right order, and you can get resources like homeworks or suggested reading. You can also visit quanta.org if you want to learn about our systems for creating computers that can answer questions, where quanta stands for question answering is not a trivial activity. If you want to help the channel, provide a big gradient to the algorithm by liking and subscribing.